Antietam, September 17, 1862. This is a new war game by Worthington Games. It is, well, about the topic described in the title. It is for two players mainly, but it can also be played by a single player controlling both forces at the best of their possibilities and seeing what happens, That which is how we play war games often. Um, we war gamers, we do that. Isn't that strange? I don't know, because we do it. The game also is the first in a new system that Washington Games has announced, so there are more slated to come out. It is a new system and yet at the same time it is also reminiscent of a lot of old games. It has definitely an old school feel to it, as you will see when I explain the mechanics. And this is meant, the designer explained in the designer's notes that precisely he wanted to go back to the old school and maybe add a couple of things or change a couple of things that may make the game more realistic. Now, as for the game itself, it is played on this large mounted board. It's a single piece, so that's nice. You don't have to put multiple pieces together and then they move or anything like that. One large piece of cardboard and if you're playing the main scenario, which you will, you want to play the whole battle, that's why you bought the game, then you will see the confetti forces set up approximately here in the center of the, of the map, and you have Union forces here and there. What a great position, you can harass a flank as they deal with that, you launch a frontal attack, awesome, right? If it wasn't that the game also mirrors McClellan's indecision, so at the beginning of the game the Union player can only move and activate some of their forces only after gaining some territorial control then can the Union player activate more forces. So the Union player will be able to activate their forces only gradually. As for those forces, they are represented by a thick, very nice looking cardboard counters that are organized uh, based on command. Basically, you have here, as you can see, units will have there on the color band the name well, well, who the heck they are? Say we have Phelps, Gibbon, uh, Patrick, Doubleday, etc. etc. Then underneath uh, the commander they, they need to be commanded by in order to be fully operational. If at the beginning of a turn, when a player takes their player turn, you check, so if Phelps is not within four axis of range from Doubleday or Hooker, then uh, Phelps cannot fully activate, in particular Phelps cannot enter enemy zones of control. Each unit projects a zone of control in the six axes surrounding it. And then of course we also have the above mentioned commanders. We have artillery which <coughs> can be also commanded by, well, by different people. As for the numbers that you see here, the number simply is the combat factor. Very simple, very intuitive. And the background of the box tells you the level of morale. Uh, gold uh, or golden is the best because uh, it means morale of nine, then black means seven, and green means four. No, this, sorry, uh, so the four means five. Units, when they take hits, uh, well, their number of combat points will go down and you will use appropriate markers to indicate that. When this unit takes uh, two hits, uh, then from eight it goes down to seven. And you need to remember that when it goes down to approximately half, uh, you flip it to the other side because the, num the, the color indicating morale will change and again from there you keep inflicting hits on it. So after a while it may get a little crowded but the good thing is that they thought about the fact that the axes need to be bigger than the unit so that you can have the unit and the new combat factor peeking out like this. If they had been a little tad bigger still, wouldn't have been, have been a problem, but then the map would have been truly ginormous. But this is the general idea that the combat factors will change, and when it goes past a certain threshold, it will also affect morale. As for morale, you roll a 10-sided die when a morale check is required, and in order to pass a morale check, you need to roll higher than the current <coughs> 
um, so sorry lower of course lower than the current morale if you roll higher then you fail the above mentioned combat check as for turn structure, each turn you have a first player going and uh, performing all that they have to do and then you have the second player also taking their turn. Each player's turn uh, goes as follows. First you have a command phase where the player, the now active player, has to check to see if their units are in command. If there aren't, then there is a marker to indicate that. And again, the unit cannot enter enemy zones of control. Then we have an organization phase. This is based on the general rules for the system. That doesn't really apply here. In other games, you may be able to build breastworks and do stuff like that. You don't have anything here. It's just pure slaughter. Offensive artillery. The artillery of the active player get to attack. Then you have the movement phase where the other units get to move. And then we have the combat phase in which uh, there is, alas, unfortunately, a defensive fire first. Uh, sorry for the uh, attackers, but it's American Civil War, and so advancing towards an attacker is always painful, as Pickett told us and showed us clearly at Gettysburg. So, after the first player or the active player's movement phase, you have the combat phase in which the non-active player gets to perform defensive fire, first player performs offensive fire, then the first player can try to rally units that routed. And then you switch and the other player goes through command phase, uh, offensive artillery, combat uh, movement, and then combat with the defensive fire and rally phase. Movement is what you expect. There is a fixed number of movement points for units of different types. So the player rate is very useful. It's not printed on the counters, but you have the player rate to remind you of who moves by what. Also here you have a reminder of the values for the morale. Combat, what everybody wants to know about. It is a war game, isn't it? So combat is important. You put together, whether you're resolving artillery fire or defensive fire or a regular uh, offensive fire, then you first check the number of strength points that you're using. Remember the number in the bottom right corner. That can be modified by range, so and also units may be able to combine their, their strength. Then you will have the total modified strength. You will look at the call and the corresponds to the total modified strength of the attacker. Roll your 10-sided die and cross-reference the result with the column that you're using. Results may be that the defender needs to take a morale check, uh, that the defender retreats, uh, and or that the defender takes a damage, in which case, as we said, you simply use these numerical counters here to indicate that and some units have a lot of points they start with like 22 so you're gonna have a lot of adding switching and turning counters to represent different levels of disorganization this is how you play the game victory that is what you're trying to achieve is based on victory points that are scored based on control of key locations on the board and elimination of enemy units so Antietam, it's it's a good game. It's a good game. Um, it's old school with all that adding, removing, changing of tokens, and the arena has its beauty, but of course also some of the cumbersomeness. Because, well, because you have to do all of those logistics. Maybe we have been you, we have been spoiled by units that you just flip to the other side when they take a hit and then you remove it when they take a second one. Or even better, uh, cubes, which I really love, uh, cubes in, I mean blocks, blocks in block war games because you can change the amount of, uh, <clears throat> of strength that they have so easily. Of course, the limitation is you're flipping, you only have two states, etc, etc, etc. So here you have the sense of more uh, more detail, of a more nuanced progression as units take attrition and you see them being reduced. But there is an extra step that, frankly, I'm not, I'm not that fond. Maybe I used to be stronger. Now I'm just so happy when a game is simpler to play. Again, becoming older, maybe become weaker. 
Now also the fact that from 20 you go to 19, you go to 18, maybe then 16, etc, etc. Uh, it means that it takes a while for actions sometimes to feel relevant because you're just chipping away little points of strength on the opponent, but then he gets to a point to realize, oh wait a second, this uh, uh, part of the line is becoming slow, is becoming weaker and thinner, so I got to reorganize things. But before you get there, there is a back and forth, there is a back and forth which may feel repetitive because I chip away at you and you chip away at me and so on and so forth. Again, there may be the retreat, the occasional route that will uh, poke holes in the line of the opponent and so will bring vari variety because again you're trying to exploit that or you're trying well, to, to uh, limit the damages that emerge from that. It is a very simple game from the point of view of complexity of the rules it could be a war game for beginners absolutely this could be the first war game that you ever play and even if you teach it to yourself I think you won't have any problem. But I do not know that it's one of the best war games out there, even among the ones that came out recently, even among the beginner things, just because of that somewhat repetitive element, the fact that you have to go through the same procedures, through the same actions, for quite a while before, quote-unquote, the game gets good, before a real sense of threat emerges, before you really have to start scrambling around and do things. I think it does a good job of depicting the historical events represented in the game at a really high bird eye level. Command is represented in a simple way that some of you may probably think of as simplistic, but I'm always happy when there is command. And of course, there's always a trade off. Command means extra rules, a lot of extra stuff to worry about. Here it is resolved very simply, and I like that. I like that hint, that brush stroke of command that doesn't come with a complicated extra set of rules, but still <clears throat> acknowledges, if nothing else, acknowledges that. Uh, that element. So the game is good. I didn't fall in love with it just because I think it takes a little longer than maybe I like for what this game has to offer, for the kind of situation it depicts, for, for the scale and, and frame that it has. Uh, and <coughs> because um, I guess I'm not old school anymore. I'm getting old but not old school. I prefer games that are... I like the simplicity of the rules, I like the procedures to be a more streamlined, and I like the game to get to the, to the hot stuff a little faster. So Antietam, it is uh, not the best game of the year, it's not bad at all, it is good.